Greetings, I'm Barrent and welcome to Meet Me at the Table. Today we are going to dive into the world of League of Dungeoneers. This is a dungeon crawler, but also has open world exploration as well. So we're going to be completing particular quests and we're going to be finishing storylines and then other ones we're going to be able to run into along the way and we're going to go to different towns and travel around and we're going to have an absolute blast playing this game. If you're excited to see League of Dungeoneers and what it has in store for us, then I need you to meet me at the table. In this video, we're going to go step by step through character creation. We're going to be creating four characters. One is already created for us right here. This is Rock Hightower, a human warrior priest. This character and all the characters that we're going to be creating were voted on by my Patreons. And so it's super cool to have them be able to help me decide who is going to be playing in this game. Not only that, all the names were also given to me by them as well. If you're interested in supporting the channel and helping decide who plays in the game, what we play, and who they actually even are, feel free to join the Patreon. The link is in the description of this video. There's a lot going on on these papers, so I'll make sure to explain it as we go through, but you do have your starting stats up here and your abilities right here, and each character has a little bit of different abilities based on what their actual class is. So for example, our warrior priest does have a prayers power or skill right here, and we'll have to roll on that to cast some of his, his warrior priest prayers. Uh, and these, every character does have weapons and armor. Those are gonna be listed on all of our characters. We are all gonna start at level one, and we start with one energy point unless our class is different. And since this is a warrior priest, we do get a few prayers that we're going to be using. We can, we're, one of our prayers is going to allow us to gain one hit point at the act, start of our activation. The other one is going to help out our wizard, which, is, uh, spoiler alert, is going to be one of our characters. We're going to be getting plus 10 arcane arts in that department when using that prayer. He also gets to start with one relic. I've chosen the relic of Ramus, which is going to give him plus 5 combat skill to be able to hit more often and hopefully do damage and kill some monsters. We do get talents and perks based on your cla character's back class, I should say. And we have Braveheart. And then the here human character gets what's called Jack of All Trades. And I'm not sure if I did this exactly right. Please let me know in the comments below if you know exactly how to do this. It says that I'm allowed to roll for a random talent from a chosen category. And all the talents are put in different categories, such as general, combat, faith, things of that nature. So what I did is I just picked a category and then rolled on that table. So for example, here in Appendix 2, you see the talents, and here's our physical and combat talents. I just chose the combat talents and then rolled a d20, and whatever it came up is what we got, and we got this tunnel fighter down here. If I didn't do that correctly, please let me know in the comments below, and I'll make sure to change that before we start our adventure. Let's create our first character. I am gonna go step by step pretty slowly for the first one, but the next two will go on a little bit faster. First thing we do is choose our species. We're gonna be making a rogue. So I am gonna create a halfling, and then after that, we're gonna roll our stats. Once they are rolled, we can do two re-rolls after we see the initial rolls. Looking at our halfling, we're going to notice that these are the starting statistics. Up here, there's a little blurb about what exactly halflings are and we've got a little bit of lore behind them. But this is what we're looking at right here. These are the base stats that the halflings have, and then we're going to be adding a d10 to each one of those stats. On top of that, the hit points they have is 1d6 plus 5. So we're going to roll all of those at one time. Before we roll, I do want to talk about what each one of these skills is going to potentially do for our character. The strength skill is your character strength. It's how much they can hold. It also is going to deal with how what type of weapons they can use with one hand is going to be part of that as well. And I believe if you get a high enough strength, you're even able to add to how much damage you do. Your constitution is going to help with disease and poison, and a high constitution is also going to allow you to get actual natural armor at some point. Dexterity is going to be exactly how well you're able to dodge, strike, jump, things of that nature. Dexterity is a very important stat in this game. Wisdom allows you to analyze important things. It's very important for wizards and alchemists, for example. Uh, resolve is going to be your character's mental strength and how he's able to deal with potential fear and things of that nature. So let's roll these up and see what we get. I've got six dice here. One, two, three, four, five, or sorry, five dice. I don't need that one. One, two, three, four, five, and then I need a six-sider for the hit points. We're going to roll all these up at once. You don't have to roll them individually. You're going to roll and decide where they go. So you do get to look at every single die roll you have here. 
So the one thing I forgot to put one is hit points right here. HP is going to be four plus five is nine, unless if I want to keep that. So right now our hit points is four plus five. Now I do get two rerolls, and you can reroll the HP die if you wish. So it looks like we have a five, a five, a five. And one, five, five, and a two. And I did forget to roll one of them. I, there's one more left I need to roll. And we got a six. So we got some pretty average numbers here. I think we're going to reroll one of the, the two and see how good that goes here. We got a 10. That's really, really, really good. We like that a lot. So we're going to erase the 10 and put it, or two and put a 10 there. And now, do I really want to reroll some of these? Most of these are about 50% or better. So it's harder to decide if I want to do that. Now, the interesting part about this is even in most games, when you reroll a die, you have to keep it. Not for this. I can choose to reroll any one of these and keep the higher number. I almost want to reroll the hit points because maybe getting a five or six might be a little bit better. Let's see. We got, oh, we got a three. So we're going to keep that four instead. That's too bad. I would have liked the five or six. That would have been pretty awesome. So we're going to now decide where we want to put each one of these numbers based on our skills over here. I'm going to guess dexterity is probably going to be the most important stat, so we're going to add the 10 to that, making our dexterity 15. That's going to be our 50, sorry, dex, right there. We can't change our hit points. Our hit points are going to be 9. The other ones are not really going to probably matter too much because they're all so close, so we're just going to keep them where they are. We're going to keep our strength at 25. Our constitution is also going to be 25, but our wisdom here is going to be... Uh, or sorry, our resolve is going to be six. Uh, or sorry, our resolve wisdom is going to be uh, what is it? Thirty-five. So I'm going to take that one, and then our last one is going to be our resolve, which we're going to make it forty-six. I think that'll be just fine. Once you've gotten to this point, you now get to add plus fifteen to any skills you want, but you have to divide it up among your skills however you want, and you can never give anything more than ten. On top of that, each class has a maximum that you can actually gain in any of these particular stats. And I meant race, not class. <laughs> For example, the halfling can ever only have up to 40 strength. So even if I gave that 10 to him up here, giving him 30 and added 10 here, 40, that'd be the max strength that character could ever have as a halfling. But all the other things he could have is over is 60 is the max that they can, or sorry, 80 is the max they can have on anything except for constitution. That is only going to be a 60. So there's no way we're gonna really going to meet any maximums here, but do be aware that there are maximums that you can only obtain with certain races. In other words, you can't just have a, halfling with a barbarian type 100 strength or something out of control so <laughs> just bear that in mind i've never played this game before so let's just go ahead and pump up all the stuff as best we can like give 10 to dexterity why not that's going to bring this back down to five i'm going to give four to resolve bringing this to 50 and i'm going to make this 36 that's going to be all of our 15 points and now we can put them into our character sheet so up here, you're going to see where they are plugged in. We'll put our 25 strength there, our constitution of 25, our dexterity though. Oh man, we're rocking a 60 dexterity. That's going to be awesome. We have a 36 wisdom and a 50 resolve. That's pretty good if you ask me. And then our hit points, of course, are nine. Now the one-handed, two-handed class that we can wear, it has to do with this strength score. So if we have a strength score of two, in order to wield a one-handed, we can wield up to a class one with a one-handed and two with a two-handed. So anything we want to buy that's going to be a one, class one means we can wield it with one hand. Anything that's a class two, we're going to have to use both our hands to wield it, which is interesting because, so for example, this character may only be able to wield up to a short sword in, in, in up to two-handed, but if somebody had up to like a 60 strength, they could wear like a giant great axe with just one hand, which is pretty sweet. Next, we're going to plug in all of the skills, and it's but it's not just a straight drop. Every class has certain bonuses and minuses based on their class when it comes to their skills. Looking at our rogue, he does not get any modifiers for any of the combat skills, range combat, or dodge, but he gets negative 5 to locks picks, plus 5 to barter, minus 10 to heal, minus 25 to alchemy, doesn't get arcane arts or battle prayers, but gets plus 1 hit points, and forging perception is going to remain at 0. The interesting thing about this is every character can become a unique type character because at any point, now we're going to choose one of these negatives, and we automatically get to turn that into a plus 10, and I'm going to choose lock picks for that one. 
So based on what we saw, our combat skill is going to be 60 because that is what our dex is. Our ranged skill is also going to be 60. Our dodge is going to be 60 because all those are not modified by anything. Our lock picks would normally be negative 5, making it a 50. Five, but I am going to add that plus 10 and reverse it. So now our lock pick is a 70. Our barter is our wisdom and we get plus five to that. So we're going to have a barter of 41. Our heal skill is going to be less than that though. It's going to be minus 10. So instead of 36, we're going to get a 26. And of course you always need to try to roll so you can get better than that in order for it to actually happen. Our alchemy skill is out of control, negative 25. We're never going to be using that. It's going to be at 11. That's Totally fine, but our perception, which is also going to use wisdom, is going to be sitting at a 36, so it's not too bad, and our forging is based on our constitution, which is only a 25, but we don't get any minuses toward it, so at least that's half the battle. At this point now, we're going to want to look at any talents, perks, starting equipment, or limitations. The only person that gets a perk is a barbarian. Nobody else does. So we're going to go to our talents, which is going to be backstabber and streetwise. We're going to write those down and have a little description for myself to hopefully remember what those do. And then we're going to grab our starting equipment, which is either a short sword or a rapier. We get a padded jacket and 10 lockpicks and a medium backpack. Also, do note the limitation on the rogue. It can never use armor heavier than male. I don't think we have to worry about that for a while. First, we have our backstabber ta talent, and talents are always on. You don't have to spend any what are called energy points in order to activate these. These are always considered on for the character. And it says here that accustomed to optimizing the odds, your hero ignores enemy armor and natural armor when attacking from behind. So we want to try to make that happen. We also have Streetwise. Your hero knows who to turn to in order to acquire gear he is searching for. Every roll this hero makes for availability may be modified by negative one. This talent can only be taken by a rogue. The way are you're gaining items in this game is you might go to a town and maybe there's something there you want to buy. Well, not every store is going to have what you want. And this is going to help him find out if these stores are going to be able to carry what they want. So say you want to buy, for example, a short sword. And it might say you, there's an availability of like two or something you'd roll a die and you'd need to get that number or higher in order to be able to buy that well this of course is going to be able to lower that number for us so it's things are going to be more readily available for this particular character i wrote both our talents down here on the back of our character sheet so we have streetwise and backstabber the next thing we need to do is decide what weapon we have. We had a couple choices. We can either, ch I'm really going to go with this rapier. I think that's my best plan here. And you're going to notice it does 1d6 plus 1. It has 5 encumbrance and it has a class 1 weapon. Now remember, I can wield that one handed. So I could get another one and I could dual wield this at some time. But I can't right now. I can only get one. Now notice it does say fast. That's an ability for this particular weapon that allows me to uh, parry multiple times. But it is easier to break our weapon. And yes, uh, weapons can break. And notice this availability. That was that stat I was just talking about when it came to trying to see if you could buy this in a town. Now, our starting equipment, we don't have to worry about that particular rule. You're always able to get your starting equipment. Thank goodness. So we have a rapier. We're going to write that down. We've wrote all the stats down for our rapier right here. Now, do remember encumbrance does play a factor in this game, of course, it, which is you, it, which is a optional rule if you wish to use it, but I think it's kind of cool to use that. We do have to take off some durability of our weapon because it's been around for a little while here. So we're going to take off one durability. That means it still has some durability left, so hopefully it doesn't get too banged up. And of course, when you lose all durability, your weapon's busted. But you can repair these weapons at blacksmiths. The next thing we need to do is gather our armor. It does tell us that our rogue is going to start with a padded jacket, which is going to give two defense to our arms and torso, which is pretty sweet. So we're going to write that down, and it is an encumbrance again of five. We've wrote all our stuff down. Now, of course, those are also banged up a little bit, so we're going to roll for our first one. Our padded jacket arms is at one durability, and our torso has taken one as well. I got really lucky on that. We got a lot of ones. That's fantastic. Now, if you notice here, as these go up here, once you get to six, your jacket, or part of your armor is going to break when it comes to this particular armor. So we've already taken one, so we can take one, two, three, four, five more, and then that's, that's going to be curtains for this. The only time it actually is going to take damage is if it actually goes over the defense and it hurt and you actually take damage. Now you can also negate even more of the damage that you're coming in with with a shield, but he doesn't have one. At least not yet, because you're also allowed to gain 150 gold that you can use, or C I should say, that you can use on anything you want. So what we're going to do is we're going to buy these padded pants, which are going to give us two defense, and I'm going to buy a padded cap. So that's going to be 130. And the last thing we're going to pick up is this buckler for 150. 
So we have our padded cap and our padded hands. I didn't write in the shield because I've got a trick that I probably is probably illegal, but I'm gonna do it anyway because I need all the help I can get. Our padded cap is gonna take some durability. It's taken one and our padded legs has also taken some durability. It has taken two. And what I mean by tricky is I'm actually gonna give it to my warrior priest because he needs all the help he can get. All he has is a padded jack, padded cap. <laughs> he needs some more armor. So I'm gonna give it to him. I don't see why you can't because technically these are adventuring party and they're gonna wanna probably kit themselves out the best they can. So, you know, the rogue went in, grabbed a buckler for him and he's got a buckler. Now, of course, his buckler is a little broken. It's taken two damage. We're gonna put those two durability there. Now, of course, that might not be exactly right, but you know, we're just having fun and it's better to keep our guys alive if we can. We're coming to rounding out our character. The first thing I had to do is make sure that he has a medium backpack. We're gonna put an M right there. And then we have to give ourselves sanity. We have a total of 10 starting sanity. That can go up and down. And if it gets too low, you could potentially gain issues with your psychology. And the last few things we have to do is, of course, our species, our level, and our luck. We do get one point of luck for being a halfling. It's the only race that gets that. One energy, which we're going to use in order to activate particular talents or prayers or something like that. Now, of course, he doesn't have anything like that from what I understand at the, at the start, but he might be able to use it for something else. And it is, of course, a rogue. Now, we have to label or, I'm sorry, name this person. So this is going to be Kit Low. That's going to be the name of our rogue. There are a few optional rules that we are going to play with. One of them is encumbrance. Our encumbrance total is going to be 15 right now. If this ever exceeds your strength score, you're going to have a negative 10 to all of the skills that you have. So we want to make sure we stay below that number. And of course, strength's only 25, so you can't carry too much more. Another one we're going to use is our backgrounds. There are 20 backgrounds, so we're going to roll the dice, see which one we get. We got a 9. Our background is poverty. It says here life in the kingdom is not easy and a few are, are those who can spend money on a whim. Your family were and still are on the very edge of survival. Growing up, you did what you could to support your family, but decided early on that there was a need for a change. As soon as you were old enough, you left your in search of other ways to bring food to the table. Living the Life of an adventuring vagabond has sustained you so far, yet you still feel the urge to improve the situation of your family. Personal trait and quest. You know the value of each coin and may never make a purchase or lend out money that would leave you with less than 10 coins. Furthermore, you must try to accumulate 1,000 coins for your family. Randomize which village, not the Silver City, in which you were born and raised. If you're a dwarf, randomize between the two dwarven settlements. Once you freely feel ready, sorry, to hand over the money to your family, pay them a visit and hand over the money. This this can be done by spending one point of movement in that village and will grant you 2,000 experience points. Of course, that's amazing amount of experience points, but I'm not sure how much it's going to cost to get up to 1,000 coins. And sadly, I'm going to go a little bit out of the limb here because it says I, will never, I would never leave myself with less than two coins, but I already did. So I'm going to take that shield back. Remember that shield I bought? I'm going to pull the shield back out from that inventory and give my 20 coins back to the uh, to our character because he can never have less than 10 coins at any one time. I wrote down our background as poverty, so I did give myself some memory tools here. It says never less than 10 coins. I have to give a thousand coin to a family in, and we're gonna roll to see where this is, and spend one action to give that coin, and then I will gain 2,000 experience. There's a table in the book that is a D8, so we're gonna roll this up and see what we get. We have a seven. So that is going to be the town of Frey Fell. So we'll write that on our character sheet. The last thing I believe, I think it's the last thing we have to do is I am going to put in his backpack 10 lock picks. Moving on to the next two characters we're going to create. This is going to go faster. I'm not going to spend as much time on all of this. We are going to be making two elves is what we're going to make. They're going to be our wizard and our alchemist. So we're going to quickly go through the parts that we've already done, but some of the parts about picking spells and potions and things, I'm going to spend a little bit more time on so you understand how that works. So we're going to take all of our dice again, roll them up, and then we're going to be able to roll two again if we want to. I'm going to re-roll this one, and we're going to roll that hit points die again, hopefully getting some better numbers there. We did not get any better numbers here but we did get five more hit points when all is said and done after putting in the starting attributes for our elf 
putting in the extra D10s that we got, and then giving myself an extra 15 points. Here is our final stats of 30 strength, 20 constitution, 47 dexterity, a 50 wisdom, and a resilience of 40. For our wizard and our alchemist, the main stat we're going to want to be able to use their, their straight up abilities is going to be wisdom, which is why I put as much as I could into there, well, to the most part. At least I made it our strongest skill. Now, this right here is going to be our alchemist. I forgot to say which one we were doing first. We're going to be doing our alchemist first. I've put in all of our stats up here, and these are now our skills. Remember, every class's skills are a little bit different based on pluses and minuses, so he does have a little bit less in his combat skill, but his range skill was supposed to be negative five. That's the one I chose to give the plus 10 to, because maybe he might be throwing potions, which would be kind of cool. He's got a really good heal and alchemy skill, and his bartering's not too bad either, but notice he has a very terrible forging skill, and he also is not very good at picking locks, which kind of makes sense. Here are the talents that this particular character gets. From being an alchemist, he is going to have resistance to poison, so I get plus 10 constitution versus that. I do get night vision and perfect hearing because I am an elf, so I'm going to get plus 10 perception, and I know there's a lot of chicken scratching on here, I guess you could say, <laughs> because I have horrible handwriting, but perfect hearing allows me to get a fifth plus 15 perception on initiative after the doors, or after I open a door, as long as it's not bashed down, and you can barely read out what I wrote here, but it does say I get an extra chip in the initiative bag for the first round of combat, as long as the monsters I'm fighting also do not have perfect hearing. After the first round of combat, that extra trip will no longer be part of the initiative bag. And you'll see how that works during the playthrough. We've gone a little bit farther with our character. The first thing is I've wrote our short sword down. We also bought a padded jacket with the 150 we have, which leaves him with 30 gold. So he's the one, unless he gets poverty too, who is going to spend the 20 gold to give that shield over to our warrior priest. Is that the right move? We'll see. Not sure. He also gets what's called an alchemist belt and alchemist tools. The alchemist belt allows you to gain six more quick slots. These quick slots are technically kind of things on your belt. So this belt is going to be able to hold six more things, but they have to be potions. On top of that, I'm able to pick three potions from a huge list of potions that I can take with me, and these are normal qualities. There's weak, normal, and superior potions. Each one is going to be doing a little bit different. For example, our acidic bomb that I have chosen down here with a weak would only do 1d6 damage, but as a standard, it's going to do 1d10, and this is a throwable weapon, so that's why I gave him a better range combat skill. He's going to be able to throw this if he wishes to to do that extra damage. Now, the other two, the potions Potion of Restoration and the Potion of Fire Breath are not throwable. Potion of Fire Breath is going to be doing damage either to two characters within two squares or one character for more damage, either two at 1d4 or one at 1d8. You'll see how that works during the playthrough, maybe if I decide to drink it. And the Potion of Restoration will fully heal somebody and also heal any poison or disease. So this is even better than a normal healing potion from what I understand. Now, on top of what you see here, he also starts with some random ingredients, and he also starts with parts. So we're going to write those on the back. Here are the different ingredients, and normally you can gain these while you're walking around outside. You could use your alchemy ability to try to find these in the environment. But we're going to roll up three of these randomly. We'll see what we get. We got a four, which is going to be a mountain berry. We got a 16, which is a toxic hogweed. And lastly, we're going to gain 14, which is bitterweed. Next, I can freely choose three specific parts here. So I'm actually going to take two tongues and an eye. Why not? What are those going to do for me? <laughs> The, these don't particularly pertain to what you're attempting to craft unless you actually have a recipe, which we do get to pick one recipe, but it has to be of a weak potion. So I would like to grab this potion of restoration. I think that'd be fantastic to be able to know how exactly to make that potion, but it doesn't have a weak component from how I understand this. This I'm not 100% sure on. I'm not 100% sure on what particular form of potion the potion of restoration is. Is it a superior, a normal, or a weak potion? It doesn't have different options for what it's going to do based on those types of requirements, weak, normal, or superior. So I'm going to say I can't know Know the recipe for this because it doesn't have that. What I mean by that in just showing these potions here is I'm actually going to know the ability to make a potion of health. That's my plan and the reason why is because it does have a weak 
a standard and a superior formula. So I believe that's what they mean by a potion that I'm able to know the recipe for as long as it's a weak potion. If I'm wrong about that, please let me know. And there may be some kind of FAQ or adjusted to the rules to at least understand and explain what exactly the power of the potions are that don't have weak, superior, or standard formulas. I'm gonna guess they are straight standard formula potions, but again, I could be wrong. So we're gonna know the recipe for the potion of health. I could, for example, also know the potion of man if I wanted to learn that one as well, which might help our wizard, but for now, this one I know will help everybody. So I've wrote down that we can make a potion of health healing. I should call it health, I push potion healing. Uh, and the components are gonna be a tongue and bitterweed, which is why I grabbed two tongues. So if we're ever out on the, in the field or we're harvesting different types of materials, we could eventually find another bitterweed and that way we'd have the ability to make a potion of healing. If, when we decide to make a potion, if you wanna make a weak potion, you have to have at least one part and one component or ingredient, sorry, and you have to have an empty bottle. Now we don't have any empty bottles right now, but if we ever drink any of the potions we have, we'll have that empty bottle available. If you ever throw a potion, for example, that acidic bomb, that potion is bottle is broken and you can't use that again. If we decide to make a standard version of this, we would have to have two ingredients and one part or two parts and one ingredient. So if I did ever want to, I could technically make a normal version of this because I did grab those two tongues and one, I still have that one bitter weed. If I want to make a supreme potion, I have to have four components and it could be any number of component, uh, sorry, any number of ingredients or parts, but you have to have at least one of each of those. Now, if you look at my ingredients I have down here and also the parts, if I ever decide to, let's say, put an eye and a toxic warg weed together, I wouldn't know what would happen, but if I was able to successfully craft that potion, I would roll on the potion treasure table and that's what I would receive. But once you know the ingredients for a specific potion, that's when you're able to know exactly what you're making when you put those together. All of these will, of course, have to be have an alchemical role to see if you're able to produce the potion or does it just blow up in your face and you don't get anything out of it. Like something out of the Muppets when Beaker and Bunsen are trying to make things. <laughs> Lastly, we have to find out our background for our alchemist. We'll see what that is. And if there's anything else I missed, I'll of course be putting pinned comments in the comment section so you can check out any errors or any adjustments to the rules after this video has been made. Let's see here, we've got a 17. We have to find ourselves a new home. And of course, this is gonna be on two different pages, just like the last one. <laughs> It says, hey, your parents had you rather late in life. Nevertheless, you had a very happy childhood. You received all the love any child could wish for, and there was always food on the table, even, it was, even if it was far from fancy. Your parents grew older and eventually passed away within a few weeks of each other. A few days after your mother's funeral, you are visited by a stranger who claims to own the house. He presents you with a contract which shows that your parents were deeply in debt to him and that the house was given to him as payment. You are given two days to clear out. With nowhere to go, you don't take much with you other than the thought of finding a new home. We have a personal quest. Even though your adventuring lifestyle suits you much better than you had expected, you still yearn for a place to call your own. Once you have acquired the Bergmeister Estate, I can gain 1,500 experience points. So I wrote our background down that we need a new home. We need to purchase an estate that's in Silver City for 6,000 coins. That is how much the Bergmeister estate is. And it's gonna, can I get 1,500 experience points? And on top of that, it has an interesting thing about the estates. If you do buy them, they could potentially have hauntings or there could be things about it that you have to deal with. So it's kind of cool that they have this whole ability put into the game where you can buy uh, potential estates and even have quests associated with them. Lastly, we'll fill out the top part, an elf level one with one energy. And thanks to our Patreon supporters, we are going to name this person Exploding Bob. Lastly, we're going to be making up a wizard. I'll be going pretty quick through this one, except for the spells. I'm going to explain how spells work, which will be pretty cool, because that's what's different about this character than the other ones we have done. First, we'll roll up all of our stats, find a couple we do not like, like this one, and of course, the three for hit points. Why well, I get more than three hit points? Come on. I got three hit points again, but I did get a six. So those are some pretty good stats, but oh, I'm a little worried about those hit points. 
I quickly wrote down all our statistics here. This is, of course, what our race starts with. And then here's what we had after I decided to add in some of the numbers, and we have our final values there. Now, one thing I haven't talked about that I think is pretty cool is the fact that the hit points are actually tied more to your race as opposed to the class. The class will just adjust it a little bit. For example, our alchemist, it doesn't just adjust the hit points at all. It leaves it at zero. Where the wizard, I actually lose one hit point based on my roll. So I did get the, the actual elf starts with D6 plus 6 hit points. So it would have started with nine because I did get a three on my roll, but because he's a wizard, he gets negative one. So I, I think that's a really cool system. Now I am basically, I dumped everything into res wisdom and resolve because I don't want him anywhere near the front line fighting or dodging or anything, but just in case I gave him a little bit better decks, but I kind of left our strength and constitution right where it's supposed to, right basically at its starting point. Here we have everything laid out for our character, and this is going to be Accius. I think it's a pretty cool name again, brought up by my Patreons. Thank you again so much for giving me some great name ideas. We have our scats up here, and then these are now going to be our skills based on how our class performs. Our, of course, arcane power is going to be super good, which is what I want. Forging is absolutely terrible, but that's okay. Uh, the other stats that I, the one that I chose that was a negative and then made a positive is my dodge score. It was actually supposed to be negative 10. I gave it plus 10, so it's a 56 based on that score over there. Before we continue with the wizard, one more thing I want to do, and then I was buying stuff, I realized, why did this guy need to give the shield up? I decided to use 30 more coins to give him a padded cap, and I'm going to use the wizard. He's the one that's actually going to buy the shield, because if he's in the front line, we have already lost the battle. Our wizard is able to gain a talent. He could either choose wise, or he could have chose a different one that gave him plus 5% increase on any reward at the end of a quest. <laughs> I think wise is best because I get plus 5 wisdom, which now brings my wisdom to 55. The max an elf can have a 60, so I'm really close to that. His arcane ability now is 69, which is super good because that's where we're rolling to see if any of his spells actually work. Being an elf, I am going to grab, I do get dark vision and perfect hearing, just like our alchemist. I'm also able to grab three level one spells from the magic table here. And interestingly enough, the wizard isn't all about combat in this game. He is the one that actually gets a healing hand. He actually gets the ability to heal people. So that might be one we're looking at. But first, let's quickly just look at one spell. You can see how the anatomy of it works. I've zoomed in on a few of the spells here, which potentially are ones we could get their level one spells. So I can show you the anatomy and exactly kind of how spells are going to work. First, you have the name of the spell. Here you have your casting value. That you're going to subtract from your arcane arts to see if you're able to cast the spell you're going to roll against it the higher the number the harder the spell is to cast so it gives spells that do a lot more power a little bit more difficulty in order to cast once that's done you're going to spend the mana cost for that spell that you cast if you fail the casting roll you still are going to spend half of your mana to be able to uh, in, 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 a, in a failure the next is your upkeep if a spell potentially lasts more than one turn there could be a mana upkeep for example our gust of wind would cost one more each round to keep going if we wanted to. And the special is going to be different things for different uh, spells that are going to have these things going on. For example, C, the Q right here is a quick spell, which means it only costs one action. A spell normally costs two to cast when it comes to actions, but quick spells can be only cost one. MM is Magic Missile. It's a type of spell cast. It basically is a Magic Missile spell. It doesn't roll to see if it hits. It just automatically does, and it has to have line of sight, things of that nature. Uh, the the other one down here is T. T means you do have to actually touch the person, hence the name Hand of Death. In order to do the damage, you have to be touching them. Now, in order to use a spell out, if somebody's adjacent to you, it has to be a touch spell. You cannot use, for example, Flare while you're adjacent to a person, an enemy, to be able to hit it with a Flare spell. Uh, that's really about it for the spells. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. I like the system. I think it'll be lots of fun to try. I like the idea of having a casting value, making things tougher or easier to cast, depending on what the spell is. Of course, going into the fourth level, it, the casting values go up quite a bit, but by then you've hopefully gotten more towards your arcane abilities. There is also ways to empower spells and add extra actions to them to make them more powerful. They also have incantation spells that aren't in the first level that you do have to spend multiple turns in order to cast, which usually is done in settlements or some kind. For example, the spell here, Magic Scribbles, has an eye that is an incantation that is going to be helping you write scrolls. Here are the spells I've decided that we're going to take. Flare Light Healing and Hand of Death. We have a ranged attack spell, a close attack spell, and then we have a healing spell for our characters. One thing I didn't mention is that the amount of mana you start with is equal to your wisdom score. So we have 55 mana, which I think should be pretty good when it comes to keeping us going with casting spells.
Every character does start with 10 sanity, and I did get him a padded jacket with the money we had, and he starts with a staff. And similar to the other characters, I did roll that d4 to figure out how much of the durability is already lost off these, and I did that with all the other characters as well. The only thing left is to see what our background is, and we got a 7. And it looks like we have a wizard that has a taste for revenge. During the early days of adventuring, you were traveling the roads with one of your childhood friends, having known each other since you could talk. You had experienced your entire childhood together, thus it was quite natural that you would leave your village together in search of fame, gold, and glory. You had been traveling for some weeks, still with no gold or glory in sight. When you were ambushed by two brigands, within seconds your friend caught an arrow through the throat and collapsed almost instantly. The rest of the fight is blurry, but you managed to overcome and kill both attackers. Although it has been some years since that episode, you sometimes still dream of your friend's last seconds. The shock of his face and the gurgling sound as the last air passed through his windpipe. We have ourselves a personal trait and quest that says you hate all enemies from the Bandits and Brigands faction. Furthermore, for every five enemies from that section or faction that you deliver the killing blow on, you gain an additional 250 experience points. Oofta, that sounds pretty good. So to sum it up, we have revenge, which gives us a hate keyword, or I should say talent, that is for bandits and brigands. Uh, every five dead, though, I'm going to gain a 250 points of experience if I do the killing blow. And hate is a talent that gives you plus five combat skill when fighting that particular enemy or groups of enemies, and I get negative five dodge or parry against an enemy. For the wizard, that's probably not going to be too bad because I, well, the parry and dodge will be bad, but I'm not really going to be hitting him with the plus five combat skill. Eh. But the finger of death that I have, that spell, that actually uses combat skill to hit when you use your touch. So this will actually help a little bit when it comes to trying to take out bandits and brigade factions. So there you have it. We have all four of our characters ready to go. I don't think there's much else. Of course, if I did miss anything or there are any errors in the creation of these characters or this game develops further on, you will see a pinned comment in the comment section and be sure to reference that. Now, if you're not wanting to take on four characters in a solo playthrough, you could do a certain amount of real full characters and then add in some brigands. Or not, sorry, not brigands. You <laughs> want brigands? He's, he's going to want to kill them all. You're, you can put in mercenaries. I apologize. Mercenaries, you can add them as well, which are quick created characters and have the same type of abilities and stuff, but are not as in-depth as these fully pre-made or fully flushed out characters that we were able to develop for this video. We're going to be starting League of Dungeoneers in the next video, so please stay tuned. This is going to be super cool. I hope you enjoyed this character creation video. If you did, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell symbol so you know when the first episode of League of Dungeoneers, we're going to take on the first missions. It's going to be super cool. Then it's going to be coming out very soon. Also, please feel free to leave anything in the comments below. I would love to hear from everyone. Do you enjoy the four characters you have? I am a little worried that we don't have really a full-on damage dealer, but I think it will still be a lot of fun to see how these characters all interact. And not only that, each one of these is a specific type of character. So we do actually have a one that uses spells, one that uses alchemical abilities, one that uses prayers, and one that just is a normal type fighting character. And it does some sneaky things as well. So it is kind of cool that we have all different classes that are going to be doing different things on the battlefield so you can see all that League of Dungeoneers has in store for you. If you're interested in supporting the channel, you can check out my Patreon. The link of that is in the description of the video as well. These characters are all voted on by my Patreons along with the names. I asked for names as well. So I was able to take some of the names from what the Patreon supporters offered as options. And if the, those that are part of the Patreon are shown here on the screen right now, thank you again so much for all your support. It means the world to me. And it was super cool to hear what everybody had to say about different names and what classes we were going to play in League of Dungeoneers. Not only do the Patreon supporters get to figure out who is in the games, they also get to watch the playthroughs usually a day before they drop for everyone else with no commercial interruptions. And if you're interested in seeing more content, Colin and I do some live playthroughs every Monday, and on Wednesdays we try to gather together for a fun painting episodes. So please stick around and join us for any of those live playthroughs. Otherwise, we're going to be coming back to League of Dungeoneers very soon. I'll be doing a recorded video for you to show you everything this game has to offer in the actual combat and exploration of it. This will be super cool. We're going to start a big adventure. Thank you again for watching, and if you're excited to see League of Dungeoneers or anything else, then I need you... Tell meet me at the table.